Hello, and welcome to this session on Trauma-Informed Schools, supporting staff and students' well-being now and next year. My name is Emily Jordan. I work with the Office of Integrated Student Supports at the Department of Education. The Office of Integrated Student Supports um, looks at many of the factors that contribute to educational success outside of academics. So we're looking at supports such as mental health supports, behavior supports, social and emotional learning, school safety, school climate, as well as supports and services for students who are considered vulnerable populations, such as students in foster care, students who are involved in juvenile justice, as well as English learners. Today we're going to be talking about trauma and what schools can do to support students who have experienced trauma. To start, let's get a basic understanding of what we mean when we say trauma. The National Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration defines trauma by stating trauma results from an event, series of events, or a set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Judy Herman explained it a little bit further by stating that traumatic events render victims helpless by overwhelming force, involve threats to life or bodily integrity, or a close personal encounter with violence and death. Traumatic events disrupt a sense of control, connection, and meaning in the, in the individual's life. Often this individual is confronted with extremities of helplessness and terror, and it can evoke a response of catastrophe. Take a minute and think about some of the students and families that you have worked with. What are some of the traumatic events that they have experienced? These may, some, may be some of the things that came to mind. Accidents, whether it's a car accident, um, or some other kind of accident. Recently on the news, I saw um, a horrible accident where a, um, several people were injured when a deck fell. You may have also heard about students and families experiencing child abuse and neglect, natural disasters, violence, whether it's in the home or the community, harassment, intimidation, bullying, medical illness, and again, whether this is for the child themselves or perhaps a close caregiver. It could be social and environmental factors, um, such as racial injustice or other social inequities. The death of a parent or caregiver, inconsistent parenting due to untreated mental health or alcohol and drug issues, experiences with war. This is especially true for our um, students who might be um, refugee or immigrants. Terrorism and other man-made disasters. And then as I noted, just the experiences themselves of immigration and, and being a refugee. Right now, we are all dealing with a collective trauma, and this is um, addressing the pandemic of COVID-19. Due to the pandemic, we've experienced a, a disruption in our sense of control, connections, and meaning. And therefore, we know it's a traumatic event. So we have to take this into consideration um, as students are returning into the face-to-face -face school environment um, and continuing throughout next year um, school year. Aside from the concerns of the physical effects of the virus, 
there have been a lot of other long term um, effects. There's been life changes in work, in school. Many families have seen changes in their finances, housing, child care, inabil inability to visit loved ones, inability to participate in activities that previously might have been um, helpful in managing stress. It's just created a lot of needs um, and, and truly has resulted as a traumatic event for everyone involved. Right now, we also have a lot of situations um, with social injustice. And again, this is another collective trauma that as a nation um, throughout the last year, we've just had a lot of news um, and a lot coming at us as far as different social injustice. Um, and this is also disrupts our sense of control, our sense of connections with others, and our sense of meaning in life. So again, that's another traumatic event. And we have to recognize how this is impacting um, adults and children. So how it's impacting the staff, uh, but also families and then our students themselves. Um, even with COVID-19, we've seen virtual education demonstrating some of the ongoing inequities in access to education, as well as multiple other social justice concerns. So these are all things we need to take into consideration as students are returning and um, throughout the whole next year, these really are going to um, have some long term um, impacts. When we talk about traumatic events, there are different traumatic events and they can be defined as acute, chronic, or complex. Acute trauma results from a single incident, such as a car accident, a loss, or a natural disaster, so perhaps maybe a tornado experience. Chronic trauma is repeated and prolonged, such as domestic violence or abuse, um, ongoing community violence, and then complex trauma is exposure to varied and multiple traumatic events. Um, and often these are very invasive interpersonal um, events. Um, so this might be something such as profound neglect or profound ongoing abuse for a very long time. Um, it could also be your parent being incarcerated and out of the home for many years, um, moving to live with a relative and then abuse in that new home. So all of those traumas on top of each other, um, kind of compounding each other can be a complex trauma. The type of trauma experienced um, will help determine um, the type and level of intervention that might be needed for a student. Um, and this is why it can be helpful if we know the trauma history when possible, Sometimes we don't know, and we are going to talk about that a little bit later. However, whenever it's possible for us to really build partnerships and relationships with families and get a true understanding of um, a student's trauma history, it can help us to understand um, what kind of interventions might be needed. The experiences of a traumatic event can vary. We know that um, many people experience traumatic events. Sometimes you can have um, two people who have experienced the same traumatic event and it impacts them differently. Um, and so it really becomes a question of why do some traumatic events affect people um, more intensively than others? What we know is trauma impacts everyone exposed to it in some way, but not every person exposed to trauma develops intense system, symptoms. Some of the factors that influence the impact of trauma include how, when, where, how often, and very, very importantly, considers what happened next. So when we talk about what happened next, this really comes down to what happened after um, to help support that individual. Um, so if let's think of the case of abuse. 
if a child reported abuse or abuse was discovered, what happened after that? Um, did someone ignore the concern? Did they just kind of shake it off? Um, or was there a supportive person actively listening, acting, actively believing that child and making the necessary steps to keep that child safe? Were counseling or mental health supports offered? All of these things impact the experience of the traumatic effects um, and the intensity of any symptoms of trauma. Many of the answers to these questions, how, when, where, what happened next, involve people and support systems. And, and I want you to think about your role in the lives of children and, and family. And all of you are people and a part of a student support system. And this is where we can all make a difference in the life of a child. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later as well. There are many um, impacts of trauma. Trauma can affect um, an individual's cognitive abilities. There can be physiological impacts, emotional impacts, behavior and relational impacts, as well as neurological development impacts. And we're gonna talk about each of these a little bit more. And these impacts are really just the tip of the iceberg that we see above the water. It's helpful for us to think about that. Um, often there's so much more going on under the water that we can't see. Um, and there really is um, multiple components that we need to take into consideration. Before we really get into the impacts and of trauma, um, I want to take a minute to talk about the stress response system because that really um, is something that affects trauma and our trauma responses. Our brain's biggest job is to keep us alive, and this includes keeping us safe. The stress response system is the body's emergency reaction to dangerous situations. This is commonly referred to as fight or flight. So for most of us, we walk around in a calm homeostasis response. We're, we're safe, our mind and our bodies are relaxed. However, when we're faced with a potential dangerous situation, our body judges the situation and decides whether or not it is stressful. This decision is based on our sensory input and processing. So the things we see, hear, what's going on around us and also based on stored memories. So it kind of draws on what has happened in the past and how did we survive and get through in similar situations. If the situation is judged as being stressful or dangerous or harmful, then our hypothalamus is activated and it sends signals to our body to respond. So our body gets flooded with hormones like adrenaline and cortisol and many other um, hormones. And then our body experiences increased blood pressure, heart rate, sweating. We may have heightened senses. Um, and while the body is experiencing this, it's really focused just on surviving. That's what it's focused on. And so what it does in order to um, focus on surviving is it shuts down other systems to help preserve energy. So for example, what happens is um, our activity in the parasympathetic nervous system is reduced. And the parasympathetic nervous system is what's responsible for rest and dig digestion. So our jet, I, goodness, our digestion slows down. We may struggle with rest or relaxation um, as well as other things. So there's different parts of our body that are kind of shutting down then focused on surviving. And all of this is just an automatic response. We don't really have that much control over it. And it happens so fast that we would struggle to control it anyways. 
Once the thread is over, the parasympathetic nervous system takes back over. And so our mind and body calm back down and we return to homeostasis. Sometimes though, what can happen if a traumatic event is so intense or is that complex compounded trauma where it's happening repeatedly for a very long time, what can happen is our bodies can kind of go into a maladaptive state and we get stuck in this repeated cycle of stress response with limited ability to return to homeostasis. And so our body is kind of constantly flooded with those hormones and constantly in this hyperarousal stage. And this impacts our body, our brain, and our functioning. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but I wanted to have an understanding of why all of that happens. So some of the impacts we see from trauma are cognitive and learning impacts. So um, we may see students struggling in the classroom to retain information. They might have an inability to concentrate. We might see them frequently fidgeting. Um, or zoning out. And when we think about this, what does that sound like to many of us? For many of us, we can say, well, that sounds like attention deficit disorder. And so um, we might have many students who are um, misdiagnosed. And so, um, you know, I think it's always good to question, could this be a trauma response versus attention deficit disorder? And it's something where we just have to kind of track what are the symptoms that we're seeing. We have to get that history if it's available to us. And, and you know, sometimes it isn't. And we'll talk more about that. Um, but it's really kind of figuring out what is going on with this student. But with trauma, we do see cognitive and learning impacts. Um, often there's a struggle with executive functioning. So that ability to be able to uh, manage time, to follow directions, um, to complete activities in, an, in a structured order. So these are the things that we're gonna have to support students with, um, understanding that they're struggling with these things and then figuring out what are the supports and interventions we can put in place to help them. So it might be breaking directions down, providing directions in a visual format. Uh, making sure that we have written the directions out and provided it to the student. And ultimately what we see is that there are more days of missed school. There can also be physical impacts of trauma experiences. We can see um, students who experience chronic pain or somatic complaints such as headaches, stomach aches, fatigue, or other vague aches and pains. These are the students that may be going to the nurse's office quite frequently, um, and we're not really seeing a medical reason um, for what's going on. And so it's something that our nurses can provide a lot of information and help um, teachers as well as counselors identify when there are patterns going on. Some other physiological impacts can be things like being hyper alert, so we may see an increased startle response from students, as well as sensitivity to sound, smells, and touch. And some of this, um, so as far as the hyperactivity and sensitive, sensitive um, sensitivity to sound, touch, lighting changes, those things, um, we really have to think about triggers and what we were talking about with that stress response. So one of the things that we said is when something, um, when a harmful or stressful situation happens, our body takes it in and it's basing it on what's going on in the situation, but also it's basing it on our past experience and what happened before um, and, and what helped us before or did not help us, what, what ended up happening. Um, so that's where some of that hyper alertness and sensitivity comes into play is, is this student being triggered by something that um, sort of relates the current events to their past experiences of trauma? 
So again, just helping us understand and, and look at students from a trauma lens and, and thinking about what's going on in the situation. Um, what is their behavior demonstrating? We also have emotional impacts. So there might be things like mood dysregulation, um, and this is where we may see mood swings. So it could be a situation where you have a student who, you know, seems fine one minute and the next minute they're in a rage or they're crying. Um, you know, th these are the kind of situations where I may have um, staff tell me, we have no idea what happened. Um, this morning, you know, he was fine and then 60 seconds later, um, he's crawling under his desk and hiding. And they're like, nothing happened. Um, it's, it, they're struggling to identify what the trigger may be. Uh, the most likely emotions to surface in response to a traumatic event are anger, fear, sadness, and shame. Traumatic stress can evoke two emotional extremes, feeling either too much or too little. Um, so you may have a student who is overly feeling a lot, and that's that um, mood swings, or you may see students who um, seem very apathetic. They're not really feeling anything. Um, they're sort of zoned out. We can also see things like increased depression and anxiety, low self-esteem, and lack of trust, both with adults and peers. Behavior and relational impacts can be impulsive, impulsivity, hyperactiveness, and we've already talked about some of that, irritability, anger outburst, temper tantrums, self-harming behaviors. We might see repetitive violent or trauma-specific play, struggling to connect with others, again, whether it's peers or adults. We might see withdrawal or disorganized attachment. And we may see perfectionism or the desire to please others. So all of these are some of the behavioral or relational impacts um, that we want to be looking out for, kind of keeping on our radar. And then there are also neurological impacts. And I'm not going to get into, um, you know, all of the neurological pieces. There's a lot of information out there. Um, I think there's a lot of really good videos that explain this very clearly. Um, so please check out the resources section. There's a great video um, from Nadine Burke Harris. A lot of resources out there. Um, what's important for us to know is that when there is prolonged exposure to trauma, especially during childhood when the brain is developing, there can be neurological impacts. Um, we're lucky that in the last 15 years, neuroscience has given us the scientific evidence to explain um, what I think so many of us in the field, whether it was education or mental health, have known deep in our guts for years. Um, we didn't quite have the explanation. We worked, you know, with children who had extensive trauma backgrounds and we saw the severe struggles they were having with forming relationships, with academics, with behavior. And we knew trauma was the factor, but we didn't really have all the science behind it. And so what's nice now is with neuroscience, we were able to demonstrate, look, there is an impact on how the brain develops. And this increased exposure to cortisol, norepinephrine, adrenaline, all of these things um, impact the body and impact how the brain grows. And so there's changes in, um, a, there could be a reduced size of the hippocampus and changes in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. Um, so that's really those, again, critical critical thinking um, section of the brain. So that goes back to that executive functioning skills and the things that students may struggle with cognitively. So they may struggle with executive functioning. They may struggle with retaining information. Um, so it could be something where you know you've taught it repeatedly and they're really struggling to remember that information. 
So again, it's just helpful for us to understand that and take that into consideration in how we're addressing behaviors, but also how we're teaching our students um, who have trauma experiences. So all of this can feel very heavy and scary at times, and it's a lot to take in. Um, some of us work with students who have extreme trauma histories, or we may be in schools where there are a high percentage of students who have experienced trauma regularly. Um, what's important for us to remember is there is hope. We can build school environments where students feel safe and supported, where they build relationships with staff and other students, and where they're connected with community supports. We can teach them the skills to safely manage symptoms connected to trauma um, and help them to build resiliency and heal. And one of the most important ways we do this is through trauma informed schools. Trauma informed schools are a school is a school in which all students and staff feel safe, welcomed and supported and where the impact of trauma on teaching and learning is addressed at the center of the educational mission. So it's really understanding what trauma is, but going so much further than an understanding of trauma, it's really about how do we apply a lens where everything we're doing in our educational mission um, is looked at from a trauma lens. Trauma-informed schools adhere to the four R's. So this is realizing the widespread impact of trauma and pathways to recovery, recognizing trauma signs and symptoms, responding by integrating knowledge about trauma into all facets of the system, and resisting re-traumatization of trauma-impacted individuals by decreasing the occurrence of unnecessary triggers. And this, um, these four R's again come to us from SAMHSA, which is the National Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. So that's kind of wordy and, and um, I, I'd say a little high level. So what does that all mean? What does that come down to? So when we're talking about trauma-informed schools, what we're talking about is all staff having an awareness and understanding of trauma. So this is providing professional development to all staff so they understand how trauma impacts um, growth, how it impacts brain development, how it impacts relationships, um, behavior, and learning. And then really focusing on building a climate of safety and support. Um, and this can be making sure that we have a climate that is consistent where all the adults are on the same page, students um, know what is expected of them, and, a, and an environment that is really focused on building relationships, which is what comes next. Relationships of trust and rapport. So how are we promoting relationships, um, not only between staff and students, but between students and students, so with their peers? What are we intentionally do, doing to build relationships of trust and rapport? Then we're providing a continuum of care or multi-tiered system of support to address trauma. And we're also working with our partners. So a system of care means we're working with our community-based mental health partners. We're working with our families. We have a whole system of people working together to provide care and support to our students who have experienced trauma. And then continually ongoing progress and monitoring um, to, to really check in. Um, are we consistently using a trauma lens? Are we doing what we said we would do and is it working? Um, you know, trauma informed schools is not something where you take a one time training you apply it and you're done. It really is a philosophy, a lens, and it's something where we're continually asking ourselves, um, are we being trauma-informed? Um, are we doing the right thing? And is it working? And if not, what changes can we make? I think trauma-informed schools takes a lot of uh, humility. 
and really, um, you know, checking in with ourselves as adults and, and what are we doing to build supportive environments, not only for students, but also for our staff and our families. So one of the things that we talk about when we talk about trauma informed schools is providing a continuum of supports. Um, again, that's also called multi tiered systems of supports, or many of you may know this as the PBIS um, triangle or tiers of support. So let's take a look at multi tiered systems of support specifically to trauma informed care. So tier one are those primary prevention supports that we're providing for all students, regardless of whether they've experienced trauma or not. These are the school wide programs that promote a safe environment. So they're promoting those healthy relationships. They're promoting self regulation skills. When we provide all of these things to begin with, um, it really does two things. What we can do is we can help um, if a traumatic experience happens to a child and we've already taught these skills they already have relationships in place with healthy adults they already have coping skills and self-regulation skills when a traumatic experience happens they can um, handle that situation a little bit better um, they have the skills um, to help it doesn't mean they're not going to have a, a trauma experience or a trauma response. Um, it just means that we might be able to kind of help mitigate the intensity of the symptoms. We're putting all of those protective factors into place and we're going to talk about protective factors a little bit um, more. So tier two are the secondary prevention or sometimes we call those early intervention pieces. So these are for small groups of students. We're not providing it to all students, um, just a small group of students that helps to assist the students with managing mild symptoms related to trauma. So this might be some skill development. It could be having de-escalation plan plans that help to reduce punitive measures um, connected to acting out behaviors that we frequently see um, in students who have experienced trauma. So some of this might be like a yoga group or a relaxation group, um, anger management group. Um, so some really focusing on building those skills. And then tier three um, or tertiary intervention is the in-depth assessment um, with trauma in mind. So this is really individualized interventions that are sensitive to traumatic experiences and how they impact the child. Um, and then developing a child center plan. Um, so again, this might be a functional behavior assessment and behavior intervention plan. It could be an actual treatment plan with a mental health agency, but really focusing on the trauma um, and what are the intervention, the individualized interventions that child needs to address trauma. So trauma informed schools, we want to make sure that we're providing all three tiers of these supports and interventions. So let's talk a little bit about classroom supports. What is it we can do in the classroom to support students who have experienced trauma? So as I said, one of the number one factors, one of the most effective protective factors in a child's life is a relationship with a trusted adult, adult outside of the family. Take a moment to think about an adult who made a positive impact on your life as a child. What was it that made a difference? How would you describe that relationship? You might think of things like trusting, caring, judgment free. It could be that that person was consistently there for you. And then ask yourself, what is it that I can provide to students to provide a similar experience? How can I build relationships with my students? Students who have experienced trauma need help building trusting relationships. 
Um, and sometimes they need help understanding that relationships are not dependent, that you're going to care about them no matter what. It doesn't matter what they offer you in return or what they have to do. No matter what, you're going to be there for that child. You're going to show up on time. You're going to consistently be there. You're going to let them know if there's going to be any changes. You know, if a substitute's coming in or something like that, whenever you can. Life happens. Sometimes we can't always uh, let them know when there's going to be changes. But whenever we can, it's going to be beneficial. Building relationships with our students by taking time outside of the academic day to get them to get to know them better can be so helpful. Um, so really asking them about what it is they like, um, asking about their weekends, finding out about them outside of either academics or their behavior. Because sometimes as adults, that's what we end up talking to kids about a lot is either learning or how they're behaving. So really take the time to get to know that student better outside of academics and behavior. But then also thinking about what are we doing to build relationships um, between peers as well? And so this can be social and emotional learning activities um, where we're structuring activities that help to build connection. Um, an example of this might be connection circles. So classrooms that have connection circles, what they do is they schedule a little bit of time, whether it's every day or weekly, and the teacher provides a prompted question that students respond to that helps them to establish, you know, connections between them. So it could be very simple things like what's your favorite ice cream? If you were an animal at the zoo, what animal would you want to be? Things like that. Um, and just having some shared discussion. But there's lots of other activities that we can do to help build relationships between ourselves um, and students as well as peers. The other thing we want to look at is building consistent and structured environments. When we are providing consistent structured environments, we can help allevi alleviate the stress and anxiety for students. And when we do that, um, we can um, kind of help to turn off that stress response system or at least keep it at a lower rate. Um, so we can do this by teaching behavior expectations, having consistent expectations throughout the whole building. This helps students um, know what's expected of them and know what they need to do. There's no like surprises about it. Um, we can provide schedules and routines. And then, as I said before, preparing students for any major changes whenever possible. So if we know a fire drill is coming, preparing them for that. If we know there's going to be an assembly, preparing them for that. Um, if there's going to be a change in teachers or a substitute, making sure that they know ahead of time, walking them through all of that, um, helping them, you know, giving them some time to talk about um, what they might be anxious or fearful about connected to that change and helping them think about what they can do to respond to that change. In the classroom, we can also take into account environmental factors such as lighting, sounds, and seating considerations. And so in some trauma-informed classrooms, what we've seen is they might have things like rocking chairs, um, I've seen some classrooms that are no longer using their overhead, um, I think, um, lights, um, that instead they're trying to find more home type kind of lighting, whether it's lamps, um, using more natural lights whenever possible. Um, and sound considerations can just be very minor things, um, but, you know, it could be things like moving desks. Um, or like a loud screeching sound, but also things like clapping of hands, raising your voice suddenly. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we want to think about. And, and when I say think about what we're thinking about is, is this something that could end up um, triggering a child? It, you know, is it something that is very related to a trauma experience? 
um, and being aware of what we're doing, but also aware of what's going on in the environment um, and, and how it might be impacting students. Sometimes we can't always prevent these things from happening, um, but we can kind of help to reduce them and help students respond to them. So, um, you know, in the case of maybe there's been a child who has experienced a tornado and then when there's the weekly tornado siren um, that goes off every Wednesday at noon, it might trigger that student. We can't stop that alarm from going off, but what we can do is when we know it's coming up, we can kind of give that student the 30 minute, you know, warning of, hey, we know this is coming up. And then the 15 minute warning, the five minute warning, working with that student, um, of what they can do when that does happen, working on their uh, regulation skills, whether it's deep breathing, um, whatever it is that helps them to manage that stress response. The other thing we can do is provide calming materials or spaces in the classroom. And when we do this, what we wanna do is start from the beginning of the year of teaching the calming techniques so we're going to be teaching deep breathing skills. We're going to be teaching progressive relaxation skills. We're going to be teaching how to use um, distraction, whether it is um, really focusing on a puzzle or um, looking at some fidgets. Um, I really like those ones that have like the water and oil and the different colors. Um, so teaching them, one, what all these different calming materials are and helping them to identify what works best for them. You can have students create their own menu. Um, I've had students select like what their top three are. It doesn't mean they always have to use those. It's just helping them identify what works best for them so that when a stressful situation happens, they're already familiar with these materials. They already know the routine of where to go, how to ask for it, um, but they're also just more familiar with it in general. Um, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm you know, going through a stress response, I'm not always thinking clearly. Um, and I can't always you know, just be like, okay, take my three deep breaths. As an adult, that's hard for me to do. And so it's definitely hard for our students. And the more that we can make it a habit and a routine and part of their daily activities, the more likely that they're going to be able to use it when they need it. It doesn't mean they're always going to be able to. They're still going to need us as adults to kind of prompt them or walk them through those pieces. Um, but the more familiar they are, the, the better they'll be able to apply it. We can provide regular breaks. Um, whether that's brain breaks throughout the day. Um, so those are very short, like five minute or less activities that we are doing. And again, whether it's like a deep breathing activity or a mindfulness activity. So we might ask students to close their eyes. And what is it they hear in the environment? What is it they smell? What does their body feel like right now? Um, it can also be some progressive relaxation activities. So these are activities where we're getting students to kind of um, stress and relax or, or um, tense and relax the parts of their body from the head down to their toes. When we take those kinds of breaks and we build them into the day, we're helping students to um, regulate and, and calm themselves throughout the day. Um, so we're, we're helping them to use that parasympathetic nervous system in their body, which is designed to turn on that relaxation response. So remember we talked earlier about how sometimes there's that maladapt maladaptation where our bodies, if we're continually in a trauma or stress response, our bodies um, may struggle in, in going back to homeostasis and calming down. And so as adults, if we're building in these regular breaks where we're practicing with students, relaxation responses, 
and we're trying to get their body to go back to that parasympathetic state or using their parasympathetic nervous system, um, the more we as the adults can build that into the day, the better it's going to help them. And then um, one of the things we can do with students who have experienced trauma is providing more choice making um, activities. One of the key factors with trauma, and we talked about this at the very beginning, is that loss of a sense of control. When a traumatic experience happens to us, um, it sort of sends this message that you don't have any control in what goes on in your life, whether it's control of your body, control over your safety, um, control over the environment. But that's one of those key factors of a traumatic experience is a loss of control. And so what we can do to help students is provide um, a sense of empowerment, um, giving them a voice and a choice, um, making sure that they feel heard, um, giving them time to talk, um, giving them time to give their opinions on things um, and providing as many choice making activities throughout the day. Um, and these can be simple choices. Do you want to sit um, over here or do you want to sit over there? But it can be more complex choices like, well, you need to do your math, but you also need to get your reading done. So which one of those do we want to do first? Or we need to do this whole math uh, worksheet Let's fold it in half. Do you want to start at the second half or do you want to start at the first half? Do you want to use pen? Do you want to use pencil? What are all the ways that we can give students choices throughout the day? And the more that we give them that sense of control, the better they can feel. And, and in all honesty, a sense of control is something that most students don't have in general. Um, students don't have a lot of autonomy of what's going on in their days. So the more that we can do that, um, it's going to kind of help relieve and calm some of that stress response system. I want to take just a little bit of time to talk about adult self-care. In order to support students, we really have to focus on our own self-care and well-being we have to be um, in a state of positive functioning um, to the best of our abilities in order to support our students. Um, and as we said before, right now we're all going through a collective trauma. Um, I'm definitely feeling it and I'm sure all of our school staff are feeling it as well. Um, we're, many of us are balancing so many things. We're dealing with the uh, our own changes and loss of control um, and and just the impacts of COVID-19. And so we have to, you know, ask ourselves, what am I as an adult doing to take care of myself um, so I can support my students to the best of my abilities? There is um, secondary trauma that staff can experience when they are working with students who have um, trauma experiences. Um, and, and trauma informed schools are actively creating plans to address secondary traumatic stress. Secondary traumatic stress is the emotional distress that arises when someone uh, vicariously experiences the traumatic experience of another individual. So this is sometimes referred to as compassion fatigue. Working with students who have trauma histories is not easy work. A lot of times there's um, behavior concerns. There's, you know, as we said before, they struggle with relationships. They might be struggling academically. And this can leave us as school staff feeling helpless, anxious. We might worry about the safety of the student. Um, we might worry about the families we're working with. And ultimately what ends up happening is we feel emotionally drained. And if this is not addressed, secondary traumatic stress can lead to emotional um, struggles and then professional burnout. And so we really have to be taking care of ourselves. And what we want to do is recognize these signs of um, secondary traumatic stress. 
So we might feel emotional, um, either feeling numb or detached or feeling overwhelmed um, or maybe even hopeless. We could have um, a physical response such as having low energy or feeling fatigued. Um, we might have behavioral responses, um, so we might change our routine or we might start engaging in self-destructive coping mechanisms. So maybe um, drinking too much or exercising too much. It could be impacting our professional relationships um, or our um, professionalism. So we might be experiencing low performance um, with our tasks and responsibilities. Cognitively, just like our students, we could be experiencing confusion, diminished concentration, difficulty with decision making. Um, we might kind of be experiencing trauma imagery um, or playing events over and over again in our head. And then we could see spiritual outcomes. So, you know, questioning the meaning of life, questioning what is it we're doing with our life, um, a lack of self-satisfaction. And we might also have interpersonal where we're withdrawing from others or being like emotionally unavailable or, or not connecting with others. So these are things that we want to be asking ourselves, you know, am I experiencing this? And then thinking of what is it we can do um, coming up with a plan for self-care, uh, making sure that, you know, what it just like with our students, you know, with those um, calming techniques, what is it that helps me and figuring out a plan for that. Um, and as I said before, trauma-informed schools build this into part of their planning and the services that they're providing. So making sure that staff are aware of um, the assistance programs available to them, employee assistance programs, what kind of counseling supports are available, um, providing them time to connect with um, their adult peers in the building. A lot of times in schools, we can feel isolated. Um, making sure that they're aware of all the supports and services um, and that they have time to bring any concerns and that they're safe to bring concerns to mentors or administrators. Um, and last, I just wanna leave you guys with some additional uh, resources and information. Um, all of the, um, or, well, you can find additional considerations. So really like hands-on strategies for what you can do for students experiencing trauma. Um, what are those strategies you can use in the classroom? You can find a lot more of those in the Student and Staff Wellbeing Toolkit. It is on the department's Reset and Restart webpage. It's also in the resources we uh, provided. This toolkit was developed in partnership with the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, and it provides information and strategies and resources on um, several topics related to COVID-19 um, and, and throughout the next year. Um, but one of those is trauma sensitive practices. But there's also things like adult self-care, um, building and sustaining relationships, building resiliency through social and emotional learning, how to support behavior, grief, and then also suicide awareness and prevention. And then for staff, we have the ABCs of mental health for educators. And really this can apply to anyone, um, whether they're educators or not. Um, this is a resource for adults um, that really asks um, to do a mental inventory of how you're feeling, um, and identify if there's any of those signs and symptoms um, of struggling with mental health. And then um, what you can do to support that. So the ABCs part of ABCs of mental health is asking yourself how you're feeling, being aware of the signs and symptoms of mental health challenges, and caring for yourself and others. Uh, so we have a web page uh, with information about that. Um, and then we also have information with social media ads, sample press releases um, that can be used to help spread these messages. Um, right now, I think it's really important for all of us to know and hear that it's OK to not be OK right now. I think everyone is struggling. You know, as we said before, we're going through a collective trauma. So this is a really difficult time. 
um, and being receptive to that and understanding we're all struggling. It's OK. There's nothing wrong with admitting that um, and asking for help when needed. So this was a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, there, You can find a lot more information about trauma and trauma-informed schools on the Department of Education's website. Um, and all of that is in your resources section. Thank you for joining us. And I hope you enjoy your other sessions as well. Have a great day.